Hello YouTube, it's Das Gregor, and welcome back to another Gen 2 Tidbits. Today I'm going to be talking about upgrading, or in our case, downgrading the kernel. Now, a couple weeks ago when they did the whole profile change from 13.0 to 17.0, I found that my VirtualBox drivers were no longer compiling correctly. At least they would compile correctly against the kernel, but they were still failing when I tried to insert them into the system. And what I then found out was that with the new use flags on GCC, that I needed to recompile my kernel against the new GCC. When I attempted to do that, I was running kernel 4.4.21. It failed because it was incompatible with GCC's new use flags. At the time, I went ahead and just did an emerge of Gen 2 sources and it pulled 4.12.12 which I assumed, okay, that must be the latest because it's March stable. And so I allowed it to go ahead and install, set everything up, and that's what I'm currently running. I have no issues, no problems with 4.12.12. I've not run into any problems at all so far in the last couple of weeks. Everything's been very stable. However, in yesterday's video when I was doing a world update in preparation for a kernel review, I noticed that the kernel 4.12.12 have been marked for removal within the next 30 days due to stability, which I'm kind of surprised about. And at the time yesterday when I was looking at what's available, they still had 4.14.8-R1 marked stable or you could downgrade to 4.9.72. Today, in preparation, I looked at the packages, and we'll go over here real quick. Today, if we look at Gen 2 sources, things have changed again. We noticed that everything, pretty much from 4.9.73 up to 4.14.10.R1, are all marked testing. And that the only thing recent for stability is 4972, which is stable for 64-bit. I did not really want to downgrade. I don't like downgrading, but since they are saying that this is the most stable version, we will stick with this. Now this is a very handy tool to look at when you're wanting to look very quickly at what's stable, what's testing, etc. And you find this at packages.gen2.org. So if we were to yeah, just delete everything here, and if you were just to go ahead and type in packages, just like that, it'll bring you here. And if you're looking for a specific atom, such as Gen2 sources, you type it in there. And then it brings you right to where we were. And that's a quick, easy way of finding out what's marked stable, what's not. Sometimes there'll be notes. For instance, right down here, masked for removal in 30 days. Upstream is no more backporting security fixes for 4.12. For a more stable kernel, please downgrade to 4.9 or move to 4.14 unstable. Now, I was going to do that. But what kind of makes me nervous is if it works for you. Well, you know what? I don't want something that might not work. So, today, while we talk about kernel upgrades, we're actually going to be doing on my system a downgrade. Now, a very good resource for doing your kernel configurations is if you do a Google search on Gen 2 kernel, you will find their wiki on the configuration page. And this is a very, very useful. I suggest anybody who wants to do their kernel, read this, go over it. There will be a link in the description. 
for this particular page. And so we look first here at you know what's the first what's available. So if we go to here. Now a lot of you guys ask me, what do you have? You know, what are your specs? Well, here you go. Here's a quick little rundown. <clears throat> As you can see, I've got the kernel 41212 running. I've been up for seven days and 20 hours on this particular machine. I've got 1,458 packages installed um, at a resolution of 1920 by 1080, running i3. Yeah, I've got a core i7 47M MQ. It says it's at 3.4 gigahertz, but I, I always thought that was t it was a 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, maybe that's if with, with all that fast threading or whatever they do to it. I've got 16 gigs of RAM. So first thing we're going to do here is we're going to make this much bigger for you guys so that you can see it on your screens. And if we do an emerge s gen2 sources, we should see that after yesterday's world update that we have the latest kernel already installed. Yes, you see latest version available 4972, latest version installed 41212. If we then do an e-select kernel list, we should see that it is available inside of this list. And I'm already in user source Linux, as you see. So one thing I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead into our super user. That'll just make things a little bit easier while we work on things. And while we're in here, you can see this is the current kernel source. If we back up one and we do an ls, you'll see that here are the different directories. And if we do an ls-lsa, you will see that user source Linux is pointing to Linux 4.12.12-gen2. So it's just a link to that particular version. We go back into Linux real quick here. We have our config. <clears throat> and what we want to do for right now is we want to copy our config back one. And I'm just going to call it. We'll do that first. We'll back up. We should now see that I have dot config. Now I'm going to move dot config to config dash 4.12.12. And now we can see it. I now have a backup of all my configuration changes and uses that I have for 4.12.12. Now what we're going to do is if we do an e-select kernel list, we see that 4972 is option 3. So we want to do an e-select kernel set 3. And if we run the list again, we will see now that 4972 is now selected as the current active kernel. If we do an ls-lsa again, we now see that Linux is pointing to Linux 4972 Gen 2. If we go back over here, we see that in this, the select 2, that does pretty much what we did. I find that even though they give you the option to do this manually, it makes much more sense to use eSelect to allow everything to be configured. Now comes to configuring the kernel. And they have changed a lot of things recently. So, one of the first things that I'm going to do that I've, <clears throat> pardon the frog in the throat, make old def config. It generates a new configuration with default values from Arch supplied def config file while at the same time maintaining all the previous options set in the .config file found at user source linux.config. 
This is a fast and safe method of upgrading a config file that has all the configuration options it needs for hardware support, while at the same time gaining bug fixes and security patches. So after doing some research, I think this one right here is something we want to do. But that's why I've backed up my 4.12.12 configuration file. So what we're going to do now that we have Linux pointing to Linux 4.9.7.2 is we're, gonna, we're going to copy our config 4.12 to Linux.config. And now if we go into Linux, we will see that .config is there and we should see that it matches 121513 January 22nd or January 2nd excuse me it is the same file so we are good to go and so the next step that we want to do is make that old def config so make old def config And as it said, it's going to pull in the default settings and it's going to rewrite our config file. Now we have a few options of editing that config file. And there are a lot of options, which is pretty neat. Now the first one that we're going to look at, we're going to look at all of these and then I'm probably going to go back to the first one because it's what we're all familiar with. Make menu config. And you want to make sure you do that as the root, of course. That's why we have went ahead and super usered into it. And as you see, this is what most people are familiar with seeing. Now, there are some other alternatives. If we exit out of here, we can do make in config. And in config is another in curses version of the config file. And as you see, it's just slightly different. We get a Pretty much the same menu system as we did before. We have some function keys down below for what you need to look at. And you can edit it this way. These are all, of course, if, if you find that you like the interface much better, you can try these. These are much uh, easier than just the standard menu config. So we're going to hit F9 to get out of there. Now, if you have Qt-based system, you will see in the instructions here that for a Qt based system with Qt GUI, you can use make x config versus if you have a GDK based system, make g config. Now I have both of these set up, so we can look at both of these x config. Now this should bring up another window, and you see this looks so different. It looks like it might actually be a little bit easier in finding a few things, but I'm not quite sure. Um, I've never really used xconfig or gconfig or even nconfig before because I've never paid attention that there were other options. But this gives you another chance to look at how the kernel is laid out and finding what you need to do and work with so that you can set that all up. So. We'll exit out of that one, and we will look at gconfig. And now we have the GDK version of this. So just a GUI-based way of doing your config changes. Now, if you're really old school, you could always do something such as nano.config. And if you wanted to, you could look at every single line here and you could change it to yes or no, or I believe make, um, m for make or such, if you're making it as a module. And you could change all of these settings manually in that .config. I don't suggest it only because if you're new to kernels and you don't know exactly what you're doing, it's best to go ahead and use one of 
the menu options. So let's go back to make menu config. Now for the most part when you are updating if you've used that old def config that means it should have pulled in all of your already working settings from your config file as well as the bug fixes and security patches. So honestly at this point in time there should be nothing that we can do or should do because it should be good. However when building a kernel there are a few things that you want to look at. One of the things, if you just start going at the top and start looking at things, most of this stuff you're not going to want to mess with. 64-bit, of course, if you've got that. In general setup, you can look at a few things, such as um, your CPU settings. And this is one thing I do like to do, and that's why I brought you into here. The kernel.config support. If you ever want to know what something is, when you highlight it, such as highlighting this, you can use your arrow key to go to help. And it says, this option enables the complete Linux.config file contents to be saved in the kernel. It provides documentation of which kernel options are used in a running kernel or in an on-disk kernel. This information can be extracted from the kernel image file with the script scripts extract ikconfig and used as an input to rebuild the current kernel or build another kernel. It can also be extracted from running a kernel by reading procconfig.gc if enabled below. So you say, Das Gregor, what is that all about? What does that mean? Well, that means that as long as you've got your VM Linux file for this kernel, if you build the config into it, if you lose your .config, if you miss, for some reason have deleted it, or it is no longer available, you could actually say, hey, that was a stable kernel, everything worked, I want to rebuild that kernel again. You can extract your config file straight from the kernel and you'll have it available again to be able to put back into your user source Linux directory to recompile that kernel or make a slight change, whatever you need to do to modify it and rebuild it again. It's an excellent way of making sure that you have your config for that kernel because it's right there with the kernel. Very handy. Now, most of these other things you're not gonna want to worry about. Most of it, it's, it's just all things that you want to allow to stay there. There's not too much you want to mess with. In processor type and features, if you have a non-standard uh, type uh, processor, whether it's Intel, AMD, whatever there is, a lot of this has been kind of stuck to just generic. So if you go in here, you can specifically tell it whether or not you have an older Core 2 or an Intel Pentium 4, you know, an Athlon 64, etc. For most people who have a 64-bit system, you're just going to want to leave this as generic x86-64. Power management, a lot of that stuff is up to you. Most of the time, if you don't ever want to use hibernation, you could take it out. Same as the suspend a RAM, although I suggest just leaving it in for those options. Anytime you see dash dash arrow, such as this, that means there's a sub menu that you can go to. An ACPI support, that's one of those that you might want to go into so that you can add additional features, such as the AC adapter, battery, fan, you know, if you have a docking station, processor. All of these things that you might want the uh, ACPI to be able to have access to. You can go ahead and build that in. A lot of times though, you don't really need to do too much with that. And you have your frequency scaling. I like to set mine to on demand, but if you have a system that you want it to always run at the top speed, 
You can change this, of course, to performance. I don't suggest you set it to power save. The three that I would suggest would either be performance, user space, or on demand. I set mine to on demand because I like it to be able to scale itself depending upon whether I'm doing a lot of compiling and if it's just sitting there idle, then it can scale itself down to not using so much. And that has helped my temperatures greatly. I mean, right now I'm running at 52 degrees Celsius and when I'm compiling it gets up to 100. So there's not much else. You can always look at some of these if you're, like I said, if you're ever wondering what does this do, then you can go to help and it explains it a little bit of what it does there. Pretty much for this power save performance, it's saying that you want to build these features into your kernel so that you can use them at a later date with other software to enable them or disable them. There's not very much you need to worry about bus options, which you can always go through and review. Executable file formats. Most of that stuff you'll never want to touch. Just leave it as it is. I have missed in networking support before and broken a lot of stuff. I don't touch networking support anymore. I leave it alone. <laughs> in device drivers, this is where it's going to be most important for you when doing a kernel upgrade or building a kernel for the first time. If we go back, let's see here, let's open up a new window here. Let's go to six. Now that's where I have my SSR. Let's go to seven and let's open up another terminal. When you do LSPCI, uh, you got to do that as sudo. You're going to see a list of your hardware, and this is going to tell you a lot of things that are important, such as the HD audio controller, uh, what USB you have, etc. If you look in here, you'll see that you know, the VGA compatible controller has an Intel, and, and this is where you're going to find a lot of your hardware. Your Ethernet adapters, you know, RTL8111 uh, is the login script and then you have your wireless and if you do that sudo lspci-vv it will become verbose and you can see what kernel modules you're running now these are the important things that you want to make sure that either are built into your kernel or set up as a module so that you can use those devices if you want to use them this is the ethernet controller for instance and it uses the module R8169. Here's another RTS5229 and if we look up here that is for the PCI Express card. Here's IWL Wi-Fi for my wireless because I've already have these things built in. It shows you what it's using already for those. Now it's very handy if you don't know what kernel module you need boot into something such as a Ubuntu Live DVD or another live distro, even the Gen 2 Live DVD, go into the console and run this and look at what drivers are being used and make sure that you write those down. And we're going to use this as a simple test, the R8169. If we go back into our kernel, whenever you want to search in the kernel for something, Use the slash key. It's normally with the question mark, at least in American keyboards, um, QWERTY keyboards, Q, Q W E R T Y. And if we look up, and my mind's already gone blank, R8169. You can see that I've got it set up as a module. You can see that it is located at the device drivers network device support, ethernet device driver support, under Realtek, and it's defined as this right here. You can see what it depends upon with the net devices, ethernet, etc. And that it also selects the firmware loader, CRC32, and the M2. So you then could go into, for instance, 
network device support. You could then go into, uh, we'll find the PCI drivers, and I've probably overshot that somewhere. Here's the wireless ones. Yeah. Bring that back up again. Network drivers, Ethernet driver support. Uh, it's been a while since I, I looked at that stuff. Well, we will look at the, ah, oh, there we are, driver support. Now, I have, it, it must have re-added some of this stuff because one thing that I usually do, if we go down here, we should see our Realtek. There's the Realtek, and there is my driver that I need. Now, one thing that I like to do, because it doesn't make sense, if you know exactly what you have, you don't need these other drivers. So you can take them out. It is safe to do this. And there's no reason to build the extra stuff into your kernel. You don't need it. Now that probably got pulled in when we did that old def config. So we want to make sure we keep our real tech driver, but we don't care about all these other ones. And it is safe to take those out. That way you keep your kernel cleaner. If we go into wireless drivers, which is the other important one for me, we don't need the AMD. We're going to keep Intel because we want to make sure that we keep the IWL Wi-Fi. I always make those as modules easier to, to try to make sure that you're keeping things um, clean. Everything else is taken out already. Now wireless and your Ethernet driver support are the two most important things, whether or not you're using a wired connection or a wireless connection. Sometimes if you have other things such as WiMAX support or if you're using USB adapters, I'll usually leave those in just in case I ever decide to plug in a USB network adapter. Nothing is there, but at least the USB network support is built in so it's available. And we exit out of there. Another thing that would be important would be, say, if you have a webcam like what we have. So if you go into multimedia, and sometimes it's easier just to kind of go through a little bit of time. You see we've built in multimedia. We have cameras, video grabber support, media USB adapters because mine's a UVC compatible. We go inside here. I've made the USB video class UVC and added it there. Nothing else needs to be built because that's the one I know I need. We exit out and we're good to go on that. Another one that you might want to look at is graphic support. You know, I've got Intel, so we have that set up and set up proper. We've got our direct rendering manager right here with a with the enabling legacy. You know, a lot of these things you just have to know what your hardware is. It's going to be specific to your your needs, your hardware, etc. Boot up logo. I like to use this to 224 color logos. Console displays. You can kind of set up a little bit of this how you like it. The 80 by 25 is usually your default. You don't want to mess with that. Sometimes you can hose how it looks. Your backlight support. Another thing that you might want to look at inside of device drivers sound card. You want to make sure you're adding in your ALSA sound card. I don't think we have to worry too much about OSS anymore. I like to make my sound card as a module because sometimes it's easier to test and to configure. And you see that I've gone in and we leave most of this stuff I believe was already set up. 
but it's important to me is I've got HD audio. So they've actually separated this out and I make everything and set it all there. Looks like there's new support for a DSP codec, but since I'm not using it right now, I'm sure it's okay. If you ever wanted to look at what that is, you can hit the help. It looks like it's for equalizer or echo cancellation. If you have a PCI sound device, you want to go in here and you find your device and you can add it. And that's where the HD audio used to be. If you've got USB devices, such as a USB headset and microphone set, you want to make sure you enable the USB sound devices and that you make the USB audio MIDI driver. That'll be useful later down the road for any type of USB based sound device that you want to plug in, even a, as it says here, a MIDI device such as a keyboard. If you actually still have PCMCIA, you could go ahead and set that up. And that's pretty much all for the sound. Your USB support's very important. You want to make sure that you have USB configured. And then if we look, we have USB 3.0 support enabled. We have 2.0 support enabled. We've got it set up for a USB monitor. If you're wondering is that what that really is, it tells you what that does. There's the standard USB support. Now, if you're going to use things such as USB uh, hard drives, you want to make sure you build that into the kernel with USB mass storage. And then there's other options in here as well if you have this particular hard drive, such as, or, or like a Lexar Jump Jot or Olympus, you know, those sort of th items. If you've got an SD card reader, I like to make that as a module too. Bring in that support. And you will see that there are some options here. You want to make sure that you do the secure digital host controller interface, the SDHCI support. In my case, mine is a Realtek PCIe. So I've set up that module. Now, if you have any of these others, you'd want to choose them instead. And that's all there is to setting up your micro SD card slot, at least in the kernel. We go through a few more of these. A lot of times you won't have to go into any of these. You just need to know your hardware well enough. And like I said, if you don't know specifically what something that you're looking for, go ahead and boot into a live DVD. Do the LSPCI, the LSUSB commands, and look for your specific hardware and see how is it being auto-loaded by that particular live setup. I'm going to exit out of here. Firmware drivers you really don't need to do anything with. Uh, you can see here, for instance, if you had a Google type system, you could add that. Dell, if you have a Dell system, you know, we don't have either of those, and there's nothing here for HP. So, File systems are very important. If you do not build the file system that you support into your kernel, and then your system may not boot up properly. Now, I'm using EXT4, so I want to make sure that that's built into the system. And it also has the option for using EXT4 for EXT2 file systems. I don't use EXT3, but you could add that if you do. And you've got your options for encryption, security labels, etc. And you can add those if you like. If you use riser FS, you would want to add that, or XFS. I have some drives that actually use XFS, so I have that enabled. If you use ButterFS, a few others that are here. Anything that you think you might need, it wouldn't hurt to go ahead and add them. If we go towards the bottom, uh, Fuse is useful to have. The Kernel Auto Mounter is useful to have. 
And then it's very good to make sure on your CD-ROM DVD drives that you've enabled everything for CD-ROMs. And if you yearn to access DOS or FAT or NTFS, it is very good to go ahead and make sure that you do MS-DOS now and VFAT. Now you say, DOS Gregor, why? Why would you want to do this? You don't want to access Windows. Well, one of the most universal ways to format your USB drive is with FAT32 so that you can throw it into just about anything and it will be seen, including your forced to have Windows whatever somewhere or your friend's system that has Windows that you need to transfer a file. And you can still mount it then inside your Linux box to be able to get access to it. So it's important to still build it. I also build NTFS just for that rare occasion. And you can write, uh, add write support to NTFS right here as well. You don't really want to mess with, of course, your default code page, your default I.O. character set, unless you know what you're doing for that. I've never messed with it. Your sudo file systems. Pretty much, you want to leave that as much as default as possible. Miscellaneous file systems. Now, if you work with Apple OS or some other off the walls, you can add these into here. UFS, for instance, read file, ROM file system support. Just uh, a few things to, to bring up. BIOS. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the Apple and Amiga. Yeah, so if you have any reason to access these types of devices, you would want to go ahead and build that support into your network. Yeah, network file support. Most of the time I just leave all of this as is. You want to make sure that you've got NFS set up, of course, and a lot of times that's already done for you. I like to go ahead and make sure that I install CIFS support. That's for, of course, uh, network shares that uh, you use between different platforms, mainly between Windows and Linux. So you want to make sure that that's enabled. I've never had to worry about native language support, and that is pretty much everything inside of the file system. You never really want to work with anything in the kernel hacking. Just leave it as is. Yeah, I've never touched anything in here. Just pretty much left it everything that it is as it is. Your security options, I've not really messed too much with this unless you are doing something special with security. You don't want to worry about it. Same with cryptographic API. Virtualization, I have it set up, but I'm not doing anything with it. And the same thing with library routines, I leave that as default. And that is pretty much everything going through most of what's important. Your biggest things that you're going to always want to change, check your processor types and, and features, power management if you want to customize that, and your device drivers for anything specific to your particular hardware, your file systems. And outside of that, everything else, pretty much you could leave. And sometimes it's safe just to leave it as it is. So we exit out, and it will ask us if we want to save our new configuration file. We really didn't change anything, but we will go ahead and say yes. Now the next step, of course, is we want to build our kernel. So we type in make. And this is where Everything just starts to go through and we wait for it to complete. So at this time, so that you don't have to just sit there and watch a kernel build, because if you're watching this, you're probably going to be wanting to watch your own kernel build. I will pause the video for right now and we will come back in just a little bit. And we're back. Everything took about 10 minutes to build the kernel. So the next step after you've compiled the kernel is to install your modules. So you do a make install modules. And modules install. My bad. <laughs> See how rusty I am with that? Make 
modules install. <clears throat> now, if you use VirtualBox or other external applications that have kernel modules that go to this, then you will also want to look up, and I have that in here, the kernel upgrades document. And what it says to do is that you want to then make modules prepare. So if we go back in here, make modules prepare. And then it says we want to do an emerge modules rebuild. So that right there. Emerge, and I like to do AV and then at modules dash rebuild. Let's verify at module dash rebuild. That will look for any modules that you may need to take care of. I'm going to pause it so we don't have to sit here since this video is already going to be so long. And as you see, we only have our VirtualBox modules. Now, it's still giving me this error because we do have Gen 2 sources for 12.12 still set up and in there. But that's okay. We can ignore this right here. And we'll go ahead and tell it yes. And it will rebuild our virtual box drivers against the new kernel. While it does that, we will look back at this and that should resolve at least our external kernel modules. And if we go back into this right here, we've done our make. And now if you have multiple cores, you could do a, Mac, a make dash J3 or J5, depending upon the number of cores you have. We've done the make modules install. The last step we're going to do once we complete all this is the make install to put the files in the boot directory where they belong. So we've, con we've done this. Now before we do that, let's do a, 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 take a look at my boot directory. Now you can see I've got these config files. Those are actually backups of the configurations of my latest. We have the system maps for the last couple kernels I've built, 443, 4421, 41212. And of course, the actual kernel themselves right here. So we do the make install, and that does something really nice for this. That's going to, now if we look at boot, we see that we now have the config file for 497. That's a backup of what we've just built. It's also because we put it inside of the kernel, inside of the main kernel itself, right here. And of course, a system map right here. Now, if I was to redo some things and update it and redo all that and do a make install again, it would rename those 4972s to .old and put in new files for us, which is really handy. I also have a backup directory that every once in a while I back up all of my kernels just to make sure that they're safe and in a spot that if I ever screwed something up really badly, I could go back to it. Now we're not done. We've just got the kernel built. Everything looks good, but we still need to set up grub. Now, I don't like to use the grub utilities too often anymore just because I like to manually set things up. And if we go to my grub file, which I believe is right here, this initially was built using the grub and I've allowed it to continue just to stay because it doesn't really hurt anything. And we will see that here is my menu entry. Now, remember I told you that originally I was running Plasma. And so I've just left it as that, even though I'm actually in i3 right now. But I do change this right here. 
So what I want to do is I want to add a new entry. So I'm going to delete pretty much everything from here down to here and then bring it back in. So for me, what I do is I just do control K to get rid of it and then control U to undo it twice. That way I still have my old menu entry. Now we're going to take the first menu entry here and we're going to change this because we now have 4.9.72 and we can leave the rest of it all there. That's all standard stuff but this is the important line right here. We're going to boot this one so we need to change that to 4.9.72 so that it matches VMLinux 4.9-72 Gen 2. Get back over there. And that's really all I have to do to add that menu entry into my grub. Don't have to just save it and I'm good to go. Now, this looks very complicated when you start looking at all this stuff. And this is something that Grub does and it tells you, you know, don't don't edit this file because it gets auto-generated. Well, I don't use the Grub commands to generate anymore. Yeah, it's just, but it's a mess. One thing I've learned with wrestling with round with LFS is you don't have to have something so complicated. If you want to just have it looking standard and easy, then this is all you really need. This is from the LFS manual right here. When it has you install grub and set up your kernel, it has you write this file, the grub CFG, setting the default to zero, set a timeout to five. Uh, you, know, you set up your, your boot partition as ext2. It tells you where your root is. And here's your simple menu entry. And that's all you have to do really to get it to work. That line right there along with your timeout if you want it, your default if you want it. And if we kind of look at how we have set up here, and we scroll back down there to those entries, you see that that Linux boot VM root SDA3 root FS type equals ext4, that right there is pretty much the same thing as what it's telling it right here in a much simpler form. So you don't need all that extra goobly gook, but it doesn't hurt. One of these days I'll clean it up and actually just rewrite my config without all that extra stuff. So once we have done that, we go ahead and save it. And we're done with that. We now have a new kernel. We have our grub set up. All we have to do now is reboot into the system. So. That is it. A super long video on, in my case, downgrading the kernel, but it would be the same features that you would do to upgrade if you needed. What I plan on doing right now is saving everything, powering down, testing it. If I run into no problems and everything's a thumbs up, I'll go ahead and just upload this video. So if you're watching this and you've been all the way to the end, and you're seeing this part right here, then that means I am good. Everything is wonderful. And if you're not, well, then guess what? You're seeing something different. <laughs> if it's morning, evening, noon, or night, whatever you're having, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope this helps you in building your Gen 2 kernel. And don't be afraid to compile, test. Remember to back up. It's always good thing to always keep backups of your known good kernels. Just because you rebuild a new kernel doesn't mean that you can't use the old kernel. Always add an extra entry in your grub config if you're using grub. I don't go over Lilo because I haven't used Lilo in a long time, the Linux loader. But always add an extra entry in your grub that points to your original kernel that did function proper for you and you, like you saw, I just copied and pasted two entries there to add that backup right there so that I knew it was still available. That way, if something does go wrong and you can't boot into your new kernel, 
you can boot right back into the old kernel and it should work and then you can fix what you need to fix try again recompile and just troubleshoot it until you figure out what went wrong that's all there is to it so until next time have a good one bye guys <laughs>